I would like you to fish out the little insert in your program folder. This is a kind of a poetic way of expressing our mission, our vision, our intention, our purpose as a spiritual family on a journey of love. And remember the word pilgrim means a person who's taking a journey to a spiritual mecca of home. So here it is. A pilgrim's prayer. Lord, what shall I do? Keep the freedom to follow a wordless whisper. Listen to the music of the spheres and dance to it. Invite the angels to do their work and incorporate you. Keep the high holy place in view and always work for the vision. Invite everyone else along and help them with their vision. Like lenses clicking into place, we will all come together in a startlingly clear holy city. Today's message is finding solid ground in shifting sands. It's a riddle. And the clues to the riddle are in this talk. First, let's review, let's review our month, the month of September, where we embarked on a journey of learning about prosperity and a journey of gathering membership renewals, because the two go hand in hand. Our board is very serious about that. <laughs> The bo and, and we collaborated to birth this idea to really share with the congregants, with people who come to this work, how important it is to give, not only of your monetary wealth, but of your time and of your gifts and of your talents. And it's really coming together beautifully. So the first step that we had in September, when it was um, Labor Day weekend, aren't there any people here, <sighs> was the first principle of prosperity is to acknowledge that God is your source. Now, what do we mean in unity by God, by God? Okay, God is not a person. God is mind, with a capital M that rhymes with N and that stands for not a person. <laughs> yeah, God is spirit. God is not a spirit. God is spirit, energy, mind. God is not a being. God is being itself. When you get right down to it, you don't really need the word God. It's an antiquated word from a hierarchical period in the development of human evolution when there were hierarchies when there were worshipped deities that man gave power to outside of himself. You know, in our um, catalog of events that I wrote about describing all the possible gatherings we could have and courses we could have, conversations we could study, the word God does not appear in that booklet at all. The word God does not appear in our brochure. The divine, yes, spirit, energy, Light, illumination, awakening, consciousness, all those words which are attractor words, which are powerful words that contain energy, that contain uplifting, illuminating energy, are, are there in abundance. So, okay, so our source is the unseen, the infinite mind of the universe is our source. But that's an abstraction. How do we engage with that and experience it? Well, that was the second sermon. The second, the second part two of Abundance for All was feeling it, feeling it. You know, in Unity, we use affirmations, and I think it's interesting that in the field of mental health, they're starting to resort to using affirmations because what other way do we have 
to create within ourselves the experience and feeling of good, the experience and feeling of freedom, but to articulate it in our internal dialogue, also known as affirmation. The first affirmation was, God is the source of my prosperity, and I am abundantly supplied. The second week was to feel it, to get it implanted in the subconscious mind, to gather substance around it, so you can feel the emotion, so you can feel the experience with energizing. And that affirmation was, I am a radiating center of divine love, mighty to attract my good and to radiate good to others. These affirmations are cornerstones that you can live by. They don't change. There's a different affirmation in, in Daily Word every day, but there are some classic lifelong affirmations that I advise you to commit to memory and live by and live from. So the second step we took to feel prosperous to feel the truth of that statement, radiating divine love to attract good and radiate good to others. Then last week, we looked at the interplay between our spiritual life and our practice of giving. And our affirmation was, I grow in my power to give that I may live anew. How many of you have discovered a complete breakthrough shift in living when you embarked on a project that was for the greater good or that was to create good. I know you have. Raise your hand. <laughs> well, I want to tell you a story about mine. Mine, it was so unexpected. Uh, you know, I was the director of youth education at the large Unity Church called Unity Temple on the Plaza. I was a full-time paying job. And while I was there, I was uh, developing the idea, I've told you about this before, I, have, I found a house and it was owned by a licensed Unity teacher and I told her I want to use this house for a children's facility. She said, well, you, we've got to find a way that you can buy it then. She, she was trying to unload it, but I didn't have the financial backing to buy it yet, but I rented it from her. I lived in it for eight years. That in itself was a blessing because I was in love with the house. To live in a house you're in love with is, is really nice. <laughs> and uh, so I'm working with Duke Tufty, who is the minister at Unity on the plaza, and Duke is a great soul. Duke is, uh, he's been there for almost 30 years now. He came from Cedar Rapids, Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls, Iowa. Where is Sioux Falls? And he was the son of the richest people in town, and he was very indulged and very, um, you might say, spoiled. And this article that he wrote was in Daily Word. I didn't know this about him, but he, he was addicted to um, cocaine and partying, and he found himself dying on the floor, choking in his own vomit. And he made a pact with God if I live, I will dedicate my life to you. And he, he did. He dedicated his life. He lived. He dedicated his life. He became a unity minister. And he had been, you know, a used car salesman. And he uses that sales, salesmanship in teaching unity all the time. When I first attended one of his services, because I'd heard a lot of buzz about him, because he's actually quite a charming and handsome guy, too, I went away saying, I don't know, he sound, sounds like a used car salesman. <laughs> he is a used car salesman. But he's so uh, dedicated to the work. And I didn't know this when I was there, but um, there was a family there who were retired. The couple was retired from having been um, on Wall Street, having been investment brokers, and they made out very well, and they became like gentlemen farmers in the outlands of Kansas City. And they had brought in three foster children as a foster home. And these three, and then they brought them to Unity. They attended Unity. I didn't know any of this. I just knew these children at, who were coming to church. 
and uh, they were African American. The church was mainly white, you know. And um, their last name was different than the, the couple who they came with. Their last name, let's just call their last name was Smith, the Smith kids. And so I came into Duke's office one time and I said, you know, this idea I'm trying to pull off with my house of having a children's facility there, I just can't seem to make it work. He said, well, why don't you adopt the Smith kids? Because their, their foster parents are, are getting tired, they're older folks. And they're, they've come to me and said they really want the courts to find a place to put these children for adoption because they just can't keep, keep up. I said, okay. So I enrolled in the um, program to become licensed foster parent. You have to be licensed as a foster home before you can apply to adopt. So that led me on quite a journey. Number one, I had to have a full physical exam, which I never do, <laughs> x-rays and everything. And um, I had to get my house polished and fixed to perfection. There couldn't be any splinters or cracking paint anywhere. And one thing that happened was, I mean, it makes sense in retrospect, but at the time I was blown away. There were a group of Buddhist monks staying at Unity Temple who traveled through the country doing work for people. Have you seen these Buddhist monks that do this? They come in a team, there's like six of them. What do you need done? We'll do it. Well, I didn't hear the part where you pay for it. Yeah. So I told Duke, I said, you know, I got a lot of chip paint. I got to get, I got to get painting done throughout the house. I don't know how I'm going to do it. He said, oh, we'll send the Buddhist monks over there. They went over, they painted the whole house up in two days. And they gave me a bill for $4,000. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. So I go into the office and I say, well, um, so I owe the Buddhist monks $4,000 for the painting. Duke pulled out the checkbook and wrote a, wrote a check right then and there. You know, that's how he was. That's how he was. So. Guess what? I didn't get to adopt the kids. <laughs> but the fact that they had options, that people were offering to adopt them, was such a gift, such a shift for them, that they were wanted, you know, in more than one place. <laughs> what happened was that um, the two older kids who were, who were teenagers were placed in a a home that had staff, that this was a couple that had adopted so many children, they had like 16 children already, and they had staff. And these children had been isolated. Their, their mother had been schizophrenic. She had actually locked them in a basement for their whole childhood. And so for them to be placed in a home with lots of children was very appealing to them. I had selected the, the, the boy of the two teenagers because he, he was real intellectual and he and I got along and I was hoping that I, they would let me have him. But uh, no, he went with, the, with his sister and they went to a big, great big family. And the youngest one had bonded with the older couple and they got, they got to adopt him and, and have him because they did really love each other, that little boy and that couple. So my point in telling you this is that when you do good in the world, remember last week I was talking about how I teach kids the little about to join the little team that if you think of bees, bees aren't happy unless they're making honey. Well, to think of humans, humans aren't happy unless they're creating good. How many of you believe that? Yeah. So to find opportunities where you can create good in the world is really our purpose in this journey. Like Drumvelo Melchizedek says, being of service is really the only thing worth doing in this life. So this month we're in a membership drive leading up to a homecoming ceremony next week. And I want to share with you what, uh, what Irene Vargo said in our, in, in our uh, member initiation class last week. We're, we're, it seems like we're only going to have one because the I was, I was having member, membership initiation class every 
Sunday after church, but the first Sunday, nobody stayed. The second Sunday, nobody stayed. Last Sunday, we had five people. This Sunday, we've got the dinner. I don't expect to have it after the dinner. And next Sunday is the Sunday. OK, well, we'll have them after that. We can have them whenever we want to. But in the membership initiation or orientation, I was explaining how we have these classrooms and we really want people to develop ideas to use this building for, to share conversations and presentations, and, and some of that's happening. Larry's putting some of the space to good use for Reiki. Uh, our friend uh, Nathan Smith, who, who was here, gave a talk a while back. He wants to give a class on the Kabbalah, which he's a student of. So it's, it's coming along. But what Irene said was, she said, I'm so used to renewing my, I'm so looking forward to renewing my vows at the membership ceremony. She said, when I found unity, it was like 40 years ago, she said, I, fi I felt like I had finally come home, that I had finally found a place where my spirituality could blossom and grow because there was freedom, there was openness, there was um, fellowship, and there was deep wisdom. So the fact that she said she was looking forward to renewing her vows really sparked my imagination. Because I did use that phrase in the membership letter. You know, did anybody see the membership letter? Renewing our vows is in there. And so next week is going to be, the ceremony is going to be centered around that idea. And don't be worried, there's only one vow. <laughs> and I'm not telling you what it is this week, but. It's a very freeing and expiring bow, OK. But uh, next week, our service will be dedicated to exactly that, the dedication of our energies to a path, a stand of spirituality in our lives. But more on that next week. Today, our emphasis is on this question, this quest, really, for coping with the vagaries of our situational circumstances, dealing with jobs disappearing, dealing with prices fluctuating, dealing with costs that keep going up, dealing with political and economic forces beyond our control, beyond our grasp, beyond our influence. How do we find a way to exist that is anchored, secure, stable, reliable? Well, here's where a knowledge of truth principles comes in. You know, in unity, you really learn how to think in a very special way that is um, really solid. And I think it makes people more intelligent. So here's the first principle. And these, this is actually part of our five basic principles, but just stated a little way, so a little different way. So the first step is in, in finding solid ground and shifting sands, in finding a secure place to stand, in finding a true place of safety and security, the first thing to know is that there is only good. This is very, very uh, obvious logically. We say that God is absolute good, that God is all there is. So if God is all and uh, God is good, if A equals B and C equals B, then B equals C. Then all is good. So then what is there to fear? Yes, but how do I relate to this good? How do I experience it in everyday practical life? And before I move away from this, from this principle, I mean, these are not logical, intellectual ideas. These are mysteries. These are mystical truths. You can't relate to them in the same way as information that you read in a book. To realize that there is only good is a mystical revelation. I can't convince you. If you want to be uh, giving your attention to notions of evil, then that's what will be real for you. But in the ultimate reality of the mystical truth of being, which is what unity with a capital U is here to share and to impart to people, 
the truth is that there is only good. Now, the second principle is, I don't need any outer thing. God supplies my every need. That God word that we don't want to use. <laughs> the one mind supplies my every need. This is a critical part of the problem with addiction now. We're so programmed, we are so used to thinking that there's some outer thing that's going to make us whole, that's going to prop us up, that's going to give us strength, that's going to comfort us to get us through the moment. And those things that we use, that we feel we need, then become our burden. They become our baggage. If we could teach every child that's born into the world, if we could teach them that you don't need any outer thing to prop you up, to be whole, to comfort you, to secure you, to feed you. What a different world we would have. God supplies my every need. I don't need any outer thing. That's not to say that we don't need each other. We are social beings. We grow in community. But the need that we have from other people is not a kind of dependency need. It's a sharing need. It's an interplay of energies that grows and expands and blesses and nurtures our hearts. And then the third principle is, I am the power at work in my life. I am the power that creates the day. I create the experience within the day. I said last week, you know, we're always creating. We might not be creating what we want, but we are never not creating because we are so powerful. Our minds, our thoughts, our energies, consciousness itself cannot not create. So when you take responsibility, to use that creative power to create good, then you really start to get somewhere. So, to find that solid ground, the third principle is to recognize that I am the power at work in my life. I create the day. I create the experience within the day. But where do I create? In consciousness. That's why it's so important to be able to keep your own counsel. You know, if we use every waking hour of the day to, uh, to create, to reflect, to create new possibilities, even if you decided not to embark on demonstrating it, you could still design strategies, solve difficulties, invent many insights, not to mention perform miracles and healed many hearts. I'm reminded of a poem by a Sufi mystic named Hafiz of Shiraz, who is quoted by Matthew Fox, the great theologian. He says, it is a naive person who does not know we are engaged in a fierce battle. For I see and hear brave foot soldiers all around me going mad and falling to the ground in excruciating pain. But you could become a victorious horse person and carry your heart through this world like a life-giving sun. But only if you and God become sweet lovers. From the 14th century, from a Sufi poet. So, now in the 40s, we're given an assignment in the first lesson. If you were taking that class, you would have been given an assignment to create something now that's an intent that you create an intention that you commit yourself to accomplishing. And I would like right now in this sermon to, in, to join us in entertaining the possibility of creating something together to demonstrate our power to be prosperous. Do you remember me saying how many of you would like to go together, to go as a group to Unity Village? A couple weeks ago, we said that. And everyone said they would like to. So 
I would like to, to set that as an agreement. I'm not saying right now we're going to agree to it, but I invite you to consider agreeing to it that we would envision ourselves as a group going to Unity Village to an event there by the end of 2021. That gives us the end of this year, all of 2020, and then in 2021, we'll find an event that we want to go to and we'll go together, those who want to go. There's another uh, intention that I want to, that I would like to set with you guys, if I could have everything I wanted. And see, we're teaching you, yes, you can't have everything, <laughs> everything you want. One thing I want is a team of people, a committee, to, to distribute flyers. Whenever we have an event, we have the flyers, but they don't seem to get put out, put out places. And it's just, you know, the last thing on my to-do list to drive around in my car and get in and out and put things on my face. So if we had a committee that got really good at it, and each person on the committee had a certain place that they would put flyers up at, and it just happened, you know, okay, we want the flyers committee to put out flyers, and gazoom, it happened. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. We can do that. We have the power to do that. And I would like to acknowledge the fact that we have demonstrated in the past our intentions, our wishes, our commitments. And, and, and I just want to point out, Autumn, you are the demonstration of the answer to prayer. Do you, do you, do you know how long I used to, for how long I used to say we want to have our sermons on video and on YouTube, and I'm just over a barrel to get how to do that? Well, now it's, it's happening. And it's happening because Autumn has the skills to do it, and she came and found a spiritual home here. Can we give her your, can we give you? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But you know, it didn't happen immediately. From the time I first met Autumn, how long was it before we clicked? Do you think about a year? I liked you from the beginning, but I didn't click into the spot for at least a year. Yeah, yeah. I liked you too, my dear. All right, so you're the prayer, so get that. <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 you are the wealth of this domain. The solid ground that we seek is our own solar plexus, our own inner core, the seat of the soul, the center core of power. You create your place to stand, and you hold the space of that stand to be a force for good. Yeah. You are the solid ground and shifting sands. You are the good that is the wealth of this fellowship. When you believe in yourself, you believe in God. Know this and be blessed by it. Amen. Thank you. Our meditation statement is, my security is in God. I stand in this truth. And so get in a position that feels receptive, comfortable, relaxed, open, peaceful. Breathe deeply. Allow the acceleration of your cells, purifying, activating, filling with light. Awaken within your heart 
being present in this moment so fully. Partaking of love, deepest love. So let us vocalize our statement together. I'll say it one more time. My security is in God. I stand in this truth together. My security is in God. I stand in this truth. And silently. And now we let, we let this word abide in us with devotion, with faith, in the silence. And so we give thanks that we are nourished with the living word springing up as the waters of eternal life. And so it is. Amen.